on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. The women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found a stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Amen, praise the Lord. It's so good to see all of you here today. Happy Easter. I'm so glad that you chose to be a part of our worship service here today. I'm Tony Walliser. I'm one of the pastors here at Silverdale, and I get the privilege of sharing with you God's Word. Um, I don't know about you, but I love growing up doing um, Easter egg hunts. Anybody beside me ever do an Easter egg hunt? I mean, yeah, I mean, most of us probably did that growing up. And what I'd do is I would always love looking for those hidden eggs and those little treasures. And as soon as I'd see an egg hiding, you know, either behind some grass or, you know, in a tree limb or whatever, I'd run over there real quick and grab it before any of my older siblings would grab it, you know. And I'd grab it real quick and I'd put it in my basket real quick. Now, here's the thing. In my day, whenever you did an Easter egg hunt, you didn't get candy or goodies or toys or money. In my day, you got a boiled colored egg, okay? <laughs> Kids, you don't know how good you got it today, okay? I mean, really, I mean, in my day, you know what? Whenever you did an Easter egg hunt, that was a thrill. You got a boiled egg and you liked it, okay? <laughs> now, the fact is, is that sometimes when it comes to Easter, you know, that change has maybe shifted in our heart a little bit. You see, today, what do we have? We got Easter egg baskets and you got what? You got plastic eggs, and you've got um, plastic grass, and there's something really subtle can begin to happen. We can begin to think that, you know what, even when you come to church and it's Easter, that, you know, it's not real, right? I mean, we come here and we wear our Easter clothes and we put on our church smiles and, and you know, we talk about a man rising from the dead. And if we're not careful, we can begin to start thinking that this whole Easter thing is just a myth. It's just a man-made religion. It's not true at all. In fact, the death, burial, and resurrection may have little impact on your life today. And so my question to you, is that you? Does really the death, burial, and resurrection make really any difference in your life at all today? And so as we want to think about this today, we want to think about the simple reality that in Chattanooga, we are surrounded by cultural Christianity, right? I mean, the, the fact is, is that, did you know this, that Chattanooga was designated as the most Bible-minded city in America? I mean, four years in a row. In fact, the last time that we were not designated the most Bible-minded city in America was 2014, and that city was Birmingham, Alabama. We came in second place. Now, I don't know if Tennesseans just don't like to be outdone by people in Alabama or what. We must have studied real hard after that, and we have been first place ever since then, okay? So here's the deal. I mean, we're the most Bible-minded city in America. So what does that mean? That means that you can ask 95% of Chattanoogans the basic facts about Christianity, and they know them. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. They know that Jesus was born of a virgin. That's Christmas. They know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and rose again. They have those facts, but they really don't know Christ. They may have gotten a plastic version of Christ, but not the real thing. They may have head knowledge that Jesus suffered for them, but they have no real <clears throat> life change. I mean, they know the facts, but they miss salvation by 18 inches. They know it up here, but they have no real true heart relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus, in the story that we're going to look at today, Jesus tells a parable, a story that addresses that dilemma. It's the parable of the wheat and the weeds. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. So I want to encourage you to take your Bibles if you have them, turn to Matthew 13. If you have your smartphone, you can open that app to Matthew 13. And you can also, you know, follow along on and take notes in this bulletin that we've provided as well. But look at what Jesus says there. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, the Bible says this. He, that's Jesus, presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
But while people were sleeping, his enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat, and left. That's very important. Where were they? The weeds and wheat were among each other, right there next to each other. Verse 26, when the plants sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also appeared. What does that mean? That means you didn't know those were weeds until the grain appeared. Verse 27, the landowner's servant came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then, then where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and pull them up? The servants asked him. No, he said. When you pull up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together. There it is. They planted together. They grow together. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, tie them in bundles and burn them, but collect the wheat into my barn. Now, that story just seems self-evident, but just in case you didn't grow up on a farm, Jesus explains it to us. Look at it in verse 38. The good seed, what does that represent? These are the children of the kingdom. You go, well, well, who are the weeds? Well, the weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Now, I've got to admit to you, this parable, I believe, is one of the most frightening stories Jesus ever told. Because Jesus is saying there are people that are among us, among the true followers of Jesus Christ, there are those that are not real. There are those that are counterfeit, that those that are sort of fake. And, and they're not going to know it until the judgment day. That's whenever the separation happens. In fact, let me make this statement. There is something worse than being on the wrong road. You go, okay, what, what could be worse than being on the wrong road? Here it is. Being on the wrong road and thinking you're on the right road. Think about that. Jesus is talking about individuals who believe they're on the road to heaven. They're among the family of God, and yet they are not children of God. They, they are among the wheat, and yet they're not wheat. They're, they're maybe even church members, but they're lost church members. You may go, well, that seems like an oxymoron, a lost church member. But that's what Jesus is talking about here. I mean, Billy Graham was once asked years ago, he said, why is it that in all of your messages and in every invitation, you always mention the unsaved church member? Why do you do that? Billy Graham said, there's really two reasons. The first reason is, is because I was an unsaved church member. I was the vice president of my youth group, and yet I had never truly been saved and knew Jesus Christ. And then he says, the second reason I always do that is because he says, I believe that the greatest mission field in America is on the church rolls. There's over 20 million Americans that claim to be a part of the church, and yet really, if 20 million Americans were genuinely saved, I think America would be a different place today, don't you? And so here's the reality. Jesus is teaching the simple reality that there are weeds among the wheat. And so what I would like to do is as we jump into this message today, I want us to ask God which we are. Who are we? And so I want everybody here, just bow your head and close your eyes, and I want you to just pray a simple yet profound prayer. It's a very simple prayer. Would you just pray this from your heart to the Lord right now? Would you simply pray, Dear Lord, if I am not saved and going to heaven, I want to know today. Dear Lord, if I'm not saved and going to heaven, I want to know today. Please show me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I believe that today, God's gonna answer that prayer to you. And as we study this parable together, you're gonna learn several ways of knowing whether or not you're on the road to heaven or you're on the road to destruction. And so what I want you to do, I want you to jot down a couple things on your outline that we've provided for you. The very first one is this. Jot this down. First of all, let's talk about the problem. What is that? Counterfeit Christians. Counterfeit Christians, that's the problem. Jesus said that among the genuine, real Christians, there are these weeds. Look at it again, verse 25. His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. In your outline, circle the words among. Among. That means they're right beside each other. They're right next to each other. They're growing together. 
right? And that's what it says. They're not only planted together, they grow together. Look at it, verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And you outline, circle the word together there. You go, what, what does that mean? It, it, it's sort of like this, you know? Just like my fingers are intertwined together. You see this? They're intertwined. Well, that's what he's saying. The, the weeds and the wheat, they're intertwined. You know, just like that, that deep theological song that we learned in maybe preschool or Sunday school or VBS, it would go like this. Remember this? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door. Here's all the people, right? Well, Jesus is saying, yeah, that's true, but some of the people that are here, they're not real. They're weeds. In fact, the word that Jesus uses here is referring to a darnel weed. It's a weed that looks very much like wheat. In fact, it's indistinguishable from wheat until when? Until finally the grain comes on the head. And it's only after the grain comes on the wheat can you distinguish the two. Well, Jesus is saying that in our very midst, there is both the real and the fake, the wheat and the weeds. And so the question always is, okay, which one are you? You see, this has been a problem throughout the centuries of Christianity. This isn't just Chattanooga, Tennessee that has this problem. I mean, you know the story of John Wesley? He's the founder of the Methodist Church. I mean, he's a very religious man. and He, he actually came from England to America to be a missionary to the Native Americans. And yet he was lost. This is what he wrote in his journal. He said this, I went to America to convert the Indians but who will convert me? He knew something was wrong. He was, he was religious. He was a missionary, and yet he wasn't real. And that's what Jesus is saying. Right here in our midst, you have the real and the genuine, and they were planted together, and they're growing up together. And from the external, everybody looks fine, right? But the Bible says this. Man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And so God is looking at your heart. He knows if you're real or not. I want you now to hear a story of one of the members from our church who found herself in this exact condition until God changed her heart and mind. Listen to the story of Wendy. When I was 16 years old, I was in high school. There's boys, there's... Um, trying to fit in, um, and lots of friends. Um, so one of my friends invited me to church, and I figured, okay, I'll go. So I did. Um, he talked about salvation. So I went down to the altar, and I was baptized a few days later. So I was under the impression that, hey, I get baptized, then I said I go to heaven, but that was not the case. I didn't get baptized that day, I just got wet. In my early 30s, I was married, pregnant, and I was serving in a church where I was asked to lead an adult um, Sunday school class. I found out that I was just doing work, so I was signing up for more stuff than I could handle, um, just trying to get approval from men. And there was a sermon about missing heaven by 18 inches. Um, I shoved it off because I didn't want to be labeled as a hypocrite, so I didn't go down. Years later, we joined Silverdale, and um, we joined the media team. So one particular Sunday, I was on cameras, and there was a sermon about um, missing heaven by 18 inches. The same exact sermon that I heard years ago that I shrugged off. So I knew this was my time to go down and actually be real with Jesus. So I called upstairs and asked, told the guys that I needed to go down to the altar. Um, so I left and went down, and there was a friend of mine that was at the very front of the church, and she came with me and took me in. We went to an encourager and prayed our way in. The shame or guilt of I'm going to be ridiculed or, or labeled a hypocrite because I've been serving in the church, that was no more. Like, I didn't have that feeling when I went down. And that following Monday, I served in mops, and there was a lady who came to um, share her story with us, and it was pretty much the same exact thing. She was serving in the church, but she didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And she finally got on the right track. And so that felt like confirmation for me that I did what I was supposed to. Giving my heart to Christ has been like so amazing. Even in the hard times, he's like my comforter. I can go to him 
Um, I can talk to him about anything and everything. Like in the mornings when I wake up, it's like him sitting on the edge of my bed waiting on me to tell him good morning and just grab him and just go throughout the day. No matter what I face, I know that I can rely on him and trust in him. And he guides me and he gives me discernment of what to be, what not to be, what to do and what not to do. And just seeing the blessings from being obedient has been unreal. Today we're looking at a story that Jesus told called The Weeds Among the Wheat. God plants a good seed of genuine salvation in a person's life, but then Satan plants a counterfeit Christian among the real. Years ago, my wife Susan and I were on vacation and we had eaten out at a restaurant. When the check came, I gave the waiter a $100 bill. He gave me a $50 bill and some change. Little did I know that that $50 bill was counterfeit. The next week, my daughter was going on a church mission trip. She was going to New York City with our church. Now, she needed some cash to take with her, so I gave her the $50 bill. Well, she tried to use it in New York City, and they immediately spotted it as a counterfeit. Of course, all the other students were like, ooh, the pastor's daughter is trying to use counterfeit money. <laughs> Thankfully, somebody was there to help her out of that bind. But I had given her that money because I thought it was real. She spent that money because she thought it was real. But then it was exposed for what it truly was, a counterfeit. And that's the sad reality of this story. These weeds have been planted by Satan. And because of that, he's deceived them. And they think that they are real and genuine, but they're not. These people think that they're saved but they're still lost in their sins. So how do you know for sure? Can you know for sure? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us you can, but you've got to do something. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. This is the most important test and examination you will ever take. Your eternity is at stake. So how do you know if you're a genuine or a fake? Well, I want to show you how. I want to give you two ways that you can examine yourself. So you can jot this down on your outline. First is the planting. Examine your conversion. I want you to think back to the event whenever you believe you first became a Christian. Think back to that time when you would say, this is when I was planted in God's kingdom. What actually happened at that time? In our story, Notice the contrast of the two seeds in verses 24. It says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat. God planted good seeds, and Satan then planted weeds. So which are you? What actually happened when you were sowed into God's kingdom? Many times, you can determine whether or not you were truly a Christian just by examining how did your faith get started. Did you go through the right steps for a true conversion to happen? Did you really touch all the bases? Years ago, baseball great Mark McGuire was one home run away from breaking Roger Maris' home run record. Mark McGuire was up to bat, and then he hit a line drive over the left field fence. And with that hit, he just broke the major league single season home run record. But something happened. When he ran around first base, he stepped over it. He didn't touch the bag. So he had to go back. Why? I'm here with local legendary umpire, Al Slater. Al, now if a person hits a ball over the fence, but then they miss first base, what happens to that batter? He's called out. Now, why is it so important that you have to touch every base in baseball? That is the game of baseball. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so what happens if you realize, oh my goodness, I didn't touch first base, what does the person have to do to make it right? Well, let's say he missed first base and he rounded second. Yeah. And he thinks, oh heck, he's got to retrace, he's got to touch second to come back over here to be legal. He can't cut across the field. Okay for it to be legal. Even though the ball was over the fence, he had to make sure he touched each base. 
Because if he didn't, he would have been called out. Well, for some of you here today, you never touched first base. You may have touched second base and gotten baptized or third base and joined a church and started serving somewhere. And you think that you're going to go home to heaven whenever you die. But if you've never touched first base, that means you've never really experienced genuine faith. You may have prayed a prayer, but you were never changed because you never touched first base. You may have believed in Jesus, but you never gave your life to Jesus because you never touched first base. So think about that time when you say you became a Christian. Because if you can't remember a time when you were truly planted by Christ, then most likely you're not saved. Now you may go, well, it's all sort of fuzzy in my mind. I don't remember much about it, but everybody tells me that I've been saved. Folks, you do not want to base your eternity on some fuzzy experience. But mama assures me that when I was little, I trusted Jesus. Friend, your mama can't assure you of your salvation. Only God can do that. Listen to me. If you don't have a clear recollection of when you gave your life to Jesus, you've probably never been truly converted. So today, I want you to examine that moment that you would consider as your conversion experience. I want you to ask yourself these three simple questions. The first question is this, did you feel conviction or guilt over your sin? That means that you knew that there was something wrong and that in your heart of hearts, you knew that you were a sinner and knew that your sin was wrong. You felt sorry for your sin. Listen, the only reason you would ever need a savior is if you knew you were a sinner. So the first question is, did you feel conviction of sin? Second question, ask yourself, did that sorrow over your sin lead to repentance? Was there repentance? That, that means you were living for yourself and your sin and you knew it was wrong and you needed to start living for the Lord. So you said, you know what? I need to turn from my sin. I need to turn to the Lord. Your sorrow over your sin should lead to repentance. Did you repent? Finally, I want you to ask yourself this third question. Did you call on Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Now, a lot of people can feel bad for their sin. I mean, every religion in the world talks about repentance. But did you call out to Jesus in your time of desperation? The Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So did you cry out to Jesus to forgive you? So those are the three elements that are critical for a true conversion experience. First, there's conviction of sin. Then there's a repentant heart, which leads to you calling out to Christ to save you, to be your Lord. And when a person has responded to Christ in those three ways, you're saved. You are what Jesus refers to as good seed being planted into the kingdom of God. But if you can't think of a time when you know without a shadow of a doubt that you did those three things, then you can't know for sure. You, you could be a counterfeit. The Bible says you need to examine yourself to see if you are truly in the faith. Every year we're told that we need to get a flu shot, but what exactly happens when you get a flu shot? So I decided to ask Lauren here. Lauren is a nurse practitioner at Sintef Medical Center here in Ottawa, and she's also my daughter-in-law. <laughs> and so Lauren, what exactly happens whenever you get a flu shot? So when you get a flu shot, um, it gives a little bit of an inactive or dead virus into your body so that your body can make antibodies to fight against the flu if you were to become exposed to it. Well, I guess I better get my shot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I got my flu shot. So with that little bit of flu virus, it should protect me just in case I come in contact with the real thing. Now the sad reality is that the very same thing has happened to some of you spiritually. Some of you have gotten just enough of Christianity to keep you from getting the real thing. Some of you got a shot of church and now you don't have Christ. Some of you prayed a prayer or got baptized, but you miss Jesus. You got a little bit of Jesus and it's keeping you from getting the real thing. And that is this story that Jesus is telling us in Matthew 13. And so how do you know? Well, you have to examine yourself. 
first examine your conversion. But there's another way that you can know whether or not you are truly a Christian or not. You need to check your fruit. You need to check and examine the fruit of your life. What is the fruit that is coming out of your life? You see, this is the ultimate test of a true conversion experience, a changed heart and a changed life. Look at how it's stated in the parable in verse 26. When the plants sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also appeared. That's how you knew the weeds between the wheat. Well, I have here some weeds, but among the weeds, I've got some wheat. And the way that you can tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds is the grain. The grain is the fruit. And that's what Jesus is talking about. In fact, Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus said, you'll recognize them by their fruit. You see, if you're here and you claim to be a Jesus follower, but there's no Jesus fruit, then there's something wrong with that. I have an apple tree in my yard, and this is a leaf from my apple tree. Now, just by looking at this leaf, you would probably not know that it belongs to an apple tree. But if I told you that it produced an apple and that this came from the same tree, you go, okay, I get it. You know a tree by its fruit. And Jesus is telling us that it doesn't matter what a person says, you'll know them by their fruit. It doesn't matter what kind of religious leaves somebody covers themselves with, you'll know them by their fruit. We can all fake the Christian life for a little while and put on the leaves of religion, but eventually the truth comes out. Eventually the bloom is going to fall off the tree and your real fruit is going to be displayed. You're known by your fruit. So what kind of fruit does a Jesus follower have? Well, that's easy because it's found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Look at what the Bible says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think about it. Those are the nine fruits that describe the personality and life of Jesus Christ. Jesus is loving. He's joyful. He's patient and kind. You can go down the list and you can see Jesus. But the question is, do you have that kind of fruit? Are you joyful? Are you faithful? Are you patient? Are you kind? Do you have the Jesus fruit? But Jesus said, you know what? Counterfeit Christians don't have that kind of fruit. No, they have thorns. Well, in the book of Galatians 5, it spells out what bad fruit looks like as well. Look at this list. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, those are sexual sins. Do you have those? Or maybe the second group. It says idolatry and sorcery. That's whenever your devotion is on other things other than God. And then the next part of the list is hatreds and strife and jealousy and outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions and dissensions and factions and envying. Those are relationship sins. In your relationships, you might have some strife or jealousy or selfishness. What kind of fruit is coming out in your relationships? Well, the final list is drunkenness and carousing and anything similar. Basically, that's the party kind of lifestyle and other things like addictions. So ask yourself, what kind of fruit do you have? Ask yourself this simple question, are you more like Jesus and his fruit? Or do you have more of the fruit of this world? You'll know by your fruit. Many of you know my story. I grew up in a small church in Florida, and I had learned about Jesus from a young age. And when I was in early elementary school, the thing that I was told to do was pray a prayer, ask Jesus into your heart, and then get baptized. Well, when I had my ninth birthday, I thought, well, it's a good time. So I mustered up the courage, came forward in the church and said, I want to get saved. So I prayed a prayer and was soon baptized. But looking back now, I realize that all I had become was a cultural Christian. I had converted to Christianity, 
but I had never surrendered my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord. I'd been baptized, but all I did was get wet. I had religion without any repentance. So when I hit the teenage and college years, I lived just like everybody else did. I went to church on Sundays and partied throughout the week. I remember playing Gabriel in the church Christmas play and then going out to a bar and getting plastered. I didn't have the fruit of the Spirit, but I sure did have a lot of the works of the flesh. I had relationship problems and sexual sins and I got drunk. You see, it was like I had this hole in my soul that I kept trying to fill with all that the world could offer me. You may say, well, why didn't you turn to Jesus for the emptiness in your heart? Because I had already had my religious vaccination. I thought, okay, I've already tried Jesus in the church. It doesn't work. It doesn't satisfy. But that was such a lie. I was exactly what Billy Graham often describes as a lost church member. In a lot of ways, I looked like other Christians, but in my heart of hearts, I knew something was wrong. I want you to hear another story from someone who was like me. They thought they were a Christian, but they were not real. I was blessed to grow up in a home with great Christian parents. They were an example of what a Christian life should be and also great examples of what uh, service should be in the church. When I was nine years old in a revival service, I went down uh, one evening during the invitation time um, to be saved. And really the only reason I did that was because my younger sister had just done the same thing and I felt like it was just something I needed to do. We all want to, uh, we want, want people to think well of us. Uh, I knew that people wanted me to be something probably along the lines of what my parents were. I was ordained as a deacon, became a Sunday school teacher, all the things that would point to a great relationship with the Lord. A lot of times inside, I was a mess. It looked, all looked good from outside, but a lot of times in my life, I was just a mess inside. But as I look back at my life, I could tell there were three things that was going on. One was I never felt any power over sin in my life. Uh, second thing was I, I never was consistently drawn to his word. And uh, thirdly, I was always unsure about my salvation. Yeah, in September of 1999, we had a revival service at Silverdale and an evangelist there. And on a Sunday morning, I was sitting in the choir loft and the, the, uh, the evangelist's message that morning was on wheat and tares. And as I, I listened to his message, it's like God spoke to me like he never had before and said, you're not one of mine. The big struggle I was having that morning when I was going through my mind, I, I knew that I, I needed to go down. I knew that I needed to make the decision in my life to make things right with Christ. At the same time though, there was this struggle going on because again, I was a deacon in the church, taught Sunday school, over, over the, had, had served in various capacities, and people had a certain expectation of who I was, and Satan was, was whispering in my ear, people, you, you can't do this. You know, people are, what are people gonna think? They think you're something that you're not. And I had to, basically that morning, I had to swallow my pride and, uh, and make things right in my life. If I look at my life after that decision, there's, there's three things that I can see as, as huge changes. One is that there is no doubts about my salvation any longer. Two is I feel like I have a, not a power of my own, but depending on God's power, as a, uh, against temptation. And, and thirdly, I have a desire to spend time with him, a desire to be in his word and, and really find out what he wants to do in my life. My prayer today for anyone who has doubts about their salvation is to uh, really think about if you've, if you've made that decision in your life, think about how your life is. Um, don't let pride get in the way. Don't let who you are or what you've done stand in your way of coming to a, a true knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. It's just not worth the risk. Powerful testimony. <clears throat> so the question today is, okay, how do you know for sure? It's pretty simple. The Bible says you have to examine yourself. Nobody can do that for you. You must do it of yourself. Examine your conversion. What really happened at that moment that you think that you became a follower of Christ? 
was there conviction of sin? Did you repent? And did you call on Jesus Christ as your Lord? What happened at that moment? The second question is, okay, what fruit is coming out of your life? Is it Jesus' fruit or is it thorns from this world? Now, the sad part of the parable that Jesus tells here is that by and large, the majority of people who um, are in this parable, they did not know they were weeds until the very end. It wasn't until the harvest time, it wasn't until the final judgment and the separation happened that people realized what was going on. Look, look at how Jesus describes this in verse 30. Jesus said, at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them, but collect the wheat into my barn. You go, what's that gonna look like? Well, he tells us, verse 39, the harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. You know, what's that going to be like? Well, verse 42, they, the angels, will throw them into blazing furnace where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What about the wheat? Then the righteous will shine like a sun in the Father's kingdom. And then Jesus ends the story with a plea. He says this, let anyone who has ears listen. It's almost as if Jesus is crying out in this story. He says, if you have spiritual ears to hear me today, listen. If God is speaking to your heart, listen. If you know something's wrong in your relationship, listen. That's what Jesus is crying out for you today. I mean... There's going to come a final judgment. We all know that. But what if it happened today? I mean, think about it. What would happen if Jesus came back today and the separation began today, right now? We'd be all shocked, wouldn't we? I mean, suddenly, what would happen? Maybe an angel would appear over there and whoosh, takes a guy away. Or an angel appears over there and whoosh, whisks a woman away. And a couple of angels go in the balcony and whoosh, pull people away. And, and in that moment, we're, we were going to be shocked. We're like, but, but, but. He was such a good guy. Or she taught in the children's ministry. Or he grew up in this church. Or, you know, I thought she was a Christian. You go, how can that be? How can people be among and not real? It's very simple. Satan deceives us. He whispers in our mind, you're okay. Don't worry about this. Don't get it right. Listen, I was deceived for years. I was a lost, unsaved church member. I was on the road to hell thinking I was on the road to heaven. Easter is simple. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He took the punishment for your sins. He rose again to prove it, to give you new life. Don't miss out on what Jesus Christ has died to give you. Don't let Satan steal from you the true life God has come to give you. Now, I know that right now, if you're struggling and you're like, I, I'm not sure if I can do this, I know there's something wrong, but, but golly, I can't make that ride. What will other people think? And pride's going to kick in. Well, I mean, other people already think I'm a Christian or I invited people here. I mean, how can I say that I wasn't a Christian yet? How can that be? What, what will people think? Let me help you out with that. Ready? Who cares what other people think, right? Who cares what other people think? I mean, I don't know about you, I would rather admit that I'm lost before a few people than to be cast into hell in front of all humanity. It's just that critical. Who cares what people think? So you may say, okay, I know something's wrong. How do I make it right? Well, how, do you, how are you going to respond? How can you become real? Well, a simple word is repent. Repentance. You see, that's the real difference between head knowledge, religion, and a true heart relationship with Christ is that when you realize your sin and your need, you repent, you turn from yourself, and you turn to Jesus Christ to be your Lord. Look at how Jesus puts this in Luke chapter 13, 13. Jesus said this, unless you repent, you will all perish. But you can settle the question today. You can settle eternity right now. Number one, do you realize you're a sinner? Two, are you willing to repent of your sins? Three, 
Do you believe Jesus is God's son who died and took the punishment for your sins and rose again? And four, are you ready to call on Jesus Christ to be your Lord today? If you are willing to make that decision and that commitment to Jesus Christ, the Bible gives you a promise. Look at it. It's found in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible says this, whoever, that's you, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can call on Jesus Christ to be your Lord today through prayer. So I want to give you that opportunity. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't want anybody to move or leave at this time. This is a holy, holy moment. Eternity is literally in the balance for many here today. But if you know in your heart that you need to make your relationship with God real and not fake, then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. I'm gonna pray it out loud, and I just want you to pray it sincerely from your heart. I'm gonna pray, and then you pray from your heart. Would you pray this? Dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry for my sinful ways. I believe that you died for me and rose again. Please forgive me of all my sins. I turn from myself and I turn to you. Please come into my life and be my Lord. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. Fill me with your spirit and give me new life. 